This is the house of Bins in West Lothian. It was a location of regular card games with Satan himself. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. In the meantime, let me tell you the story. Do you believe in ghosts and demons? Let me know in the comments section. If this was an episode of Most Haunted, I'd spend the episode collecting questionable evidence that there was something mysterious in the tale of a man playing cards with a devil in this house, leaving us spookily uncertain. But since this is an episode of Scotland History Tours, what I'm actually going to do is tell you the story of the man who was born and lived here, then show incontrovertible evidence that he sat long into the night playing Satan at cards. Or was it Buckaroo? I've seen this National Trust for Scotland run monument on the hill loads of times as I've passed on the M9 to Edinburgh, but I've never got round to coming up here, which is crazy. From the folly on this hill, you get some gorgeous views across the fourth estuary in that direction and West Lothian countryside that way. And the hills are important because the name, the Bins, comes from the Gaelic Ben for hill. This is the House of the Hills. And as part of a four episode series telling you why you should visit West Lothian, I want to tell you the story of Tam of the Bins, the man who lived here, the man who played cards with the devil before Chris the Burr was even a glint in his father's eyebrows. Born here in 1615, Tam of the Bins lived a life that was eventful. It spanned the most tumultuous times on these islands and he was at the heart of them. See, when you were 13, did you have a job? I had a paper round. This guy was in Charles I's army fighting the French because in 17th century Scotland, you couldn't get a daily record anywhere. So, young Tommy Binns sets off to fight the French religious wars. The Three Musketeers, Duke of Buckingham, Cardinal Richelieu and anyone else that wanted a square go. The head of the Anglican Church, Charles I, supported the French Huguenot Protestants against their Catholic King. At the same time as the Protestant Dutch supported the Catholic French King and the Catholic Spanish supported the Protestant Huguenots. There was no way to avoid these wars, even if you supported Partick Thistle. If you're one of the international viewers, don't even try the subtitles to get you out of that one. It's cultural. Anyway, 20 years later, Tam was a colonel fighting under Covenanter generals in Ireland during the War of the Three Kingdoms. Now, if you still call it the English Civil War, then riddle me this. What were they doing in Ireland fighting with Scottish Covenanters? Who will come back to? The important thing here is not to lose focus. Stop it! Charles the First War of the Three Kingdoms, English Civil War, showed what a proper royalist and loyalist Tam was. When Scots delivered Charles the First to Cromwell's parliamentarians for later execution, Tam refused to shave his beard as a personal penance for the behaviour of his countrymen. Now that might sound silly, but I haven't shaved my armpits since Scotland drew with Iran in the 1978 World Cup finals. The Scotland manager was so ashamed that he got one of those comb over hairdos. <laughs> As Cromwell's forces overtook Ireland in 1650, Tam was captured at Carrickfergus. He was banished from Scotland, but the fact that he was later with Charles II's army when Royalist hopes finally came to an end at Worcester suggests that he'd managed to sneak back to Scotland in disguise. Then, he was imprisoned in the Tower of London, but managed to escape six months later. He and some of the 1978 Scotland midfield tied their beards together and used them as a rope to climb out the window. But having escaped, he went abroad and a couple of years later, he was back getting involved in Glencairn's rising in the Highlands against Cromwell. 
In May 1654, at the Market Cross in Edinburgh, the first union between Scotland and England was declared. Cromwell was declared Lord Protector of Scotland, England and Ireland, and the Scots, who'd committed crimes against them, were pardoned. But Tam of the Bins was excluded from this act of grace. In fact, a 200 guinea reward was put up for his capture, dead or alive. That's when he stopped cutting his nostril hair. In spite of the price in his head, Tam manages to escape and reinvents himself as a Russian officer fighting against the Turks and the Tartars. Life has been busy. So imagine you're 45. You fought the French, led troops in the most all-encompassing war in the British Isles, been banished from your country, imprisoned and escaped from the Tower of London, lived as a fugitive, as a mercenary on foreign soil, and all of it whilst tripping over facial hair. But you've never played cards with the devil. The peak of your notoriety is just the start. When Oliver Cromwell died, Charles II was invited back to be King of England with all sorts of promises of bygones being bygones and all that. He'd already been crowned King of Scots 11 years before that and signed the National Covenant in order to do so. If you're in any doubt about what the National Covenant was, then check out my video on the Covenanters. Basically, what sparked off the War of the Three Kingdoms was the people of Scotland signing a covenant to say that Charles' dad, the now headless Charles I, wasn't above the Scottish Church. Now, Charles II had to sign it so as to get the Scottish crown, but he really wasn't in a position of strength at the time. Now, he was. So after the restoration of the English throne in 1660, he imposes a progressively tighter and increasingly brutal crackdown on people who didn't recognise his right to be above the church and impose bishops, the very thing that kicked things off in the first place. Now, if you're going to impose a brutal regime of religious persecution, who would you invite back from exile but that ever-loyal beardy guy Tam of the Bins, who'd fought for the Covenanters in Ireland before your dad's head choppy thing. This is where Tam of the Bins gained his brutal reputation. He implemented a pitiless violence with a gusto which gained him the epithet Bloody Tam. Now the painting of Tam in the National Gallery in Edinburgh's Mound shows him clean shaven, so maybe this is the point at which he gave up the role of penitential and started communing with Satan. He certainly reported to have hung a child who wouldn't give up his father, had an innocent man shot for failing to provide information that they knew he didn't have, just to set an example to others. Even DL's own men had to be forced to follow through on some heinous war crimes. The list of brutality goes on and on, and you can read about them in the book Covenant and Stories. Link in the description. But all his intemperate temporal activities and persecution of the Covenanters are trumped by a supernatural event that took place here. Now, the story goes that in his clean-shaven years, Tam had regularly played cards with Satan. But in the event that I'm going to describe, this must have happened after 1681, for reasons that will become apparent. So, Bloody Tam and the Devil are in the house in one of their midnight card-playing sessions. Satan is losing badly. All he's holding is a pair of twos, a jock of clubs, and Mr Bones the Butcher. What's more, Tam knows what Satan's holding. Ha <laughs> ha, because he strategically placed a mirror in the room so that it's behind the satanic playing partner. No matter how close Satan holds his cards to his chest, his reflection is invisible. So that means that you just see the cards. Genius, isn't it? Until Satan realises what's going on and he goes mental. He loses it and throws the card table at Tam. Now, Tam ducks and the table flies out the window. Ironically, hitting some ducks along the way. But finally, 
it falls into this pond. Now, this pond is called the Sergeant's Pond. Later on, Tam was appointed colonel at the formation of the famous cavalry regiment that would go on to be called the Scots Greys. You've probably heard about them at Waterloo. And the pond here was dug so that the dragoons could water their horses when they were at the house. Now, that's why this supernatural demonic furniture throwing had to have happened after 1681. The legend of this event grew after Tam's death in 1685, as did rumours of a ghostly horseman on a grey horse riding along this road to the house, and Tam's cavalry boots marching round the house on their own. And then, 200 years later, during a severe drought in 1870, as this pond dried up, poking out of the water surface was a marble-topped card table. The very card table that Satan had thrown at Tam of the Bins 200 years earlier. What I'm saying is, there's lots to see and do in West Lothian and House of Bins is just one of them. Go to this webpage to find out more about places to visit in West Lothian or find the link in the description. Of course, if you'd like another video on West Lothian history and places to visit, then there's one coming up on screen now. In the meantime, Hamian Dochis can be a lama alive. Cherry and Rast.